It's our pleasure to have uh, with us today uh, Dr. Tatak from Nebraska. He's the first, is the first uh, fMRI uh, lecture series for the academic year 2022. It's going to be hybrid. And I would like to thank WTS and Zoritsa that they put this, this uh, uh, seminar together. Dr. Katak is a professor of civil environmental engineering at the Nebraska and director of the Mid American Studies Center at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. He specializes in transportation safety, construction planning, and health transportation systems uh, for all the most and uh, freight as well. Dr. Katak is a, an accomplished author who has published more than 100 publications on various transportation uh, areas. He served as an inaugural editorial board member of the Transportation Business Records and he, 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 he immediately passed chair of the DRB Study Committee on Highway Railway Crossing AR080. Dr. Katak is both on the ground and the courses in highway engineering, urban transportation planning. Geographic information system, transportation engineer, and travel demand. Dr. Katak, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for uh, having me here. I appreciate uh, being here. And uh, um, I'll get started just by way of background. I'll uh, just talk about some notions of uh, safety, and then we'll go into more details of why railroad crossing uh, safety is important and uh, what has been done and then towards the end i'll also talk about uh, some of the research projects that i have done so um, as far as highway safety so highways are highway facilities are designed uh, and constructed to prevailing standards uh, but these standards do not guarantee total safety. I mean, we have accidents every day uh, on our uh, transportation system. So uh, crashes happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, usually it's a combination of factors. Uh, and generally they are difficult to ascertain or, or understand. And, you know, we try to analyze safety data and uh, try to get insights into it. Uh, but design standards, are based on research. So if we are using, let's say for highway design, we use the green book. Uh, uh, if we are using those design standards, this, those are based on research and those are um, adopted by standard setting organizations. So some of them are, for example, ASHTO or ACI here in the United States. Um, these standards, if you design your facilities to these standards, they provide what we call nominal safety. And this is a safety level that's acceptable and it's basically based on the trade-offs and long-term long experience. Uh, but we really don't know uh, the exact safety, the exact amount of safety that these design standards provide. So, we might design two facilities to the same design standards and one may have more accidents than, than the other, um, but, but they provide just a nominal level of safety. Uh, substantive or quantitative safety is the actual safety performance for a particular facility. Uh, and that's generally based on the crash frequency and severity uh, of those crashes. And generally, it's determined over a long period of time. Uh, we look at the uh, facility, its operations, and, and figure it out over a long time, long period of time. Uh, safety will vary for different types of highway facilities, and assessment is generally based on the safety record uh, of similar facilities over a period of time. So if you design a new facility, then you compare its safety to other similar facilities and, and figure out if it's performing adequately or not. And then highway safety manual uh, is available. It provides guidance on assessment of different types of highway facilities in terms of how you are going to analyze them. Um, highway rail crossings are, are not yet included. They will probably be included 
at some sometime in the future. As far as measures for safety, uh, so we can use several measures. Uh, crash frequency is the you know is the gold standard, so to say, for measuring safety. As basically the number of crashes reported or reported uh, over some time period, usually a year. Uh, crash rate is another one, and this is basically the number of crashes divided by some some measure of exposure. So you know, million vehicle miles of travel, for example, would be a measure of exposure, and we use that uh, so to figure out crash rates. And then uh, crash injury severity is another measure of safety. Many times we are unable to prevent uh, crashes from happening. Um, we, in, in that case, we try to minimize the severity of the accident. So uh, you can think about you know, guardrail, for example. Uh, it's not meant to prevent the accident from happening, but it's meant to prevent the severity or reduce the severity of the accident. Um, crash injury severity, there are several different scales available in terms of how you measure severity. So the most common scale that we have is the capital scale, uh, K is for killed or, or uh, fatality. So a accident would be, if there's one or more fatalities, it would be termed as K type. A is incapacitating injury. Um, B type is when it's uh, evident. Uh, injury C is when there's a complaint of pain, uh, but it's not an evident injury. And then O is for property damage only accidents. And then AIS is another abbreviated injury scale, is another measure that's mostly used uh, in hospitals. Uh, but CAMCO scale is widely used on, on accident reports uh, and it's fairly easy to, to implement. Um, another measure of safety is equivalent crashes because, you know, a, an accident that may involve um, a fatality obviously is much more serious than, you know, let's say property damage accident. So we use equivalent crashes in which case we convert everything to common units. Uh, so uh, we might, let's say, have, you know, 10 property damage accidents equal to one fatal accident. And I'm just coming up with this. So, um, so we can use equivalent crashes and this helps us compare different locations. One place where there was one fatal accident versus another place where there were 15 property damage accidents. Where do you use your safety dollars? So this enables us to kind of do a more apples to apples comparison. And then, of course, there is crash costs uh, because these crashes are accompanied with costs. And you know, there are US Department, US DOT provides crash costs. There are crash costs available from other agencies. You can convert everything to dollar amount and then you can compare those as well. Crashes are relatively uncommon events. Um, uh, sometimes we have <clears throat> cases where we need to assess. The safety of facilities that are relatively new, they may not have the accident history. So we then have to use uh, uh, some surrogate measures. And these may be, let's say, traffic conflicts. So we go there and study traffic conflicts. They are you know, more numerous and, and traffic conflicts, for example, gives us an idea about you know, safety. So locations where there may be more traffic conflicts might very well experience more accidents. And uh, so sometimes if we don't have access to traffic accidents, then we rely on uh, several measures of safety. So uh, with that background, uh, let's talk about highway rail crossings. Uh, and when I talk about highway rail crossings, these are at grade rail crossings, which means that the highway and the rail train uh, tracks cross at the same level. So we are not talking about grade separated uh, uh, facilities. Those are basically they are safe because they separate the two modes of transport and you know, there's no conflict. 
uh, and grain rail crossings uh, are critical junctions in the transportation network because there are two different modes of transportation that are coming together at these locations. Most of the US rail system is privately owned uh, and most of it is used for transportation of freight. Uh, we've got about 212,000 rail crossings at grade across the nation and about 140,000 miles of track across the country. Uh, most of it is used for moving heavy freight such as coal, lumber, or uh, agriculture products. And then also a lot of hazardous materials are frequently transported via rail. Uh, we've got, uh, with respect to freight transportation, we've got seven class one railroads. So these classes of railroads depend upon uh, their uh, revenue and, and the, you know, the, the largest of these are the class one railroads. But then at the next level, we've got regional railroads and we've got 22 of those. And then the local short line railroads, we've got about 584 of them. Of them. And all of these are privately owned. Um, the freight industry, the rail freight industry provides about 167,000 jobs nationwide. You know, it's a nearly $80 billion industry. Railroads own and maintain the tracks and they spend about $25 billion annually on the maintenance and adding capacity to their network. Uh, railroads move about 28% of the US freight by ton miles. Um, and that's about 52% of that is bulk commodities and 48% of that uh, freight is consumer products and other miscellaneous products. Uh, railroads utilize a variety of cars uh, depending on the goods that are being transported and uh, freight trains. Uh, the average length is about 73 cars, but the length has increased over time. And uh, right now, trains in 150 to 200 cars are becoming common. Uh, so, a 200 car train, you know, depending on how fast it's going, will take a fairly substantial amount of time when it's crossing uh, at a crossing. Again, these trains have speed limits just like we have speed limits on highways. So they, they can't speed or, or they can't travel faster than uh, the designated speed. So, you know, if it's urban area and they're traveling at 25 miles per hour, a 200 car train might take 10 minutes to cross over. And this is important, especially in the Midwest where a lot of the towns were built along train stations and now the railroads kind of divide the towns into parts. If you've got an emergency, emergency on one side of the town uh, and your response uh, center on the other side, it becomes difficult to, to attend to it. So, um, a lot of cities in, in the Midwest, what they have done is they have response centers on both sides of the railroads, but that's obviously not a very efficient model. Um, go back. Uh, fuel efficiency is higher with railroads. About one ton of freight can be moved 470 miles on a single gallon of diesel fuel. So that's much more efficient than if you were to move the same freight, uh, let's say via trucks. So they are on average four times more efficient than trucks. Uh, with respect to safety at uh, highway rail crossings in terms of importance, uh, crashes are typically more severe uh, at these locations, primarily because there's a train involved in it and you know, trains cannot stop very quickly. Uh, so the crash costs at these crossings are typically higher than crashes elsewhere on the transportation or at least on the highway network. Um, crashes can potentially affect both rail and highway networks because if you've got an accident that blocks the rail crossing, well, 
the highway traffic will obviously be affected because they can't cross over and then the train traffic is obviously affected so it 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 can uh potentially disrupt supply chains that are reliant on on the two networks um the annual combined grade crossing crash costs are estimated to be about 650 million dollars in the u.s uh this uh, slide just shows uh, <clears throat> the uh accidents at rail crossings and then the um, injuries and, and fatalities uh, so the top line just shows the accidents uh, yearly accident accidents in the united states uh, and you can see that each year there's about uh, close to 2000 accidents reported at rail crossings in the u.s the next line from the top is the injuries in these accidents and again uh, on average we've got about six to seven hundred injuries in these accidents and the bottom line that's in red shows the fatalities that trail crossings and it's about 200 and 200 to 250 uh, fatalities every year at trail crossings now some of these fatalities also include suicides it's very difficult to separate suicides uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, people decide to, to end their lives at, at rail crossings, perhaps because one reason it's deemed to be an accident and, and that's socially more acceptable. Um, it's very difficult to separate the suicides from, from the real accidents. Um, usually it depends on the coroner's reports and and stuff like that but nonetheless at the end of the day the numbers we may very well include uh, some suicides in any case Can we, I ask you a i'm sure are we allowed to ask yeah. Yeah. sure yeah. No, because yeah, this is startling graph like in, in a whole decade you know the numbers are kind of same mm -hmm. so is it not advancing in any way the science and our knowledge and the design code standards. So, uh, so thank you for the question. And I've got a couple of slides uh, coming up. I'll show some more recent trends. It depends on the time horizon. If you compare present numbers to, let's say, 1980 uh, numbers, certainly we've made significant improvement in these numbers. They are significantly less than what we used to have back then. Oh, so just to give you an idea, back in 1980s, we had about seven, 8,000 accidents at rail crossings. Now we are down to about 2,000 or so. Uh, so there has been substantial improvement made for a variety of reasons. But nonetheless, if you look at a decade or so, they are in fact increasing over the past decade. And I'll show some of the slides. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, so here's a, a slide for uh, that just shows you know the trend over the past 10 years and if you look at you know the pre-covid trend line was increasing actually uh slightly so there's a line that shows the trend it's just a linear trend uh, but pre-covid it was increasing of course with covid everything changed and, and the numbers for 2020 are substantially lower but this is just frequency of accidents uh, there was substantially less traffic uh, uh, and the numbers have kind of bounced back in 2021 so i would imagine 2022 numbers would again be it'll be back on track so to say unfortunately the trend line over the 10 years is kind of increasing and then the next slide shows the fatalities and again the pre-covid trend line is kind of increasing over the past decade uh, but again, like I said, it depends what you compare it to. So if you're comparing it to 1970s and 80s, we've made substantial progress since then. And do you also separate between the urban areas and non urban areas? We can separate urban and, and rural areas and, and look at all sorts of trends, yes. But this is just national trends. So again, fatalities have kind of <clears throat> come down due to COVID, but again will probably bounce back the numbers so this is just um, um, 
an overall kind of a summary uh, about the railroad crossing safety and trespass prevention. Now I'm talking only about rail crossings and the safety at rail crossings, but there's also trespassing. That's a separate issue uh, because trespassing can occur anywhere along the length of the tracks. It's very difficult to, to kind of combat trespassing because of the uh, large geographic area that's involved in that. At least with the rail crossings, it's a geographically um, uh, identifiable location, but the trespassing accidents is another dimension to um, you know, uh, safety of the railroad system. Um, and we've got over here, th these numbers are a little dated, but nonetheless, in 2014, there were approximately 480 trespasser fatalities uh, across the country. So it kind of gives you an idea. Again, we can go into with respect to rail crossings. You know, we've got different types of rail crossings in the sense that there are different types of safety arrangements. You know, some may have active warning devices. <coughs> and active warning devices might be gates or flashing lights or bells and whistles uh, that come on when there is a train. Um, on the other hand, about 36% of the crossings that just have uh, passive warning signs. So these may be cross bugs or a sign that says, well, you know, rail crossing ahead. And there's no active warning at, at that particular location. So um, in any case, we've got about 212,000 crossings in aggregate. And again, there's also public versus private crossings. So public crossings are those where public can cross, but there are also a small portion of private crossings. And these are not everyone has access, but adjoining land owners have access on, in something like that. Most of the time we are concerned with the public crossings and the safety of public crossings. Uh, with respect to active warning devices, um, <clears throat> There are actually three generations of train detection technology because you would have to detect the train uh, at the crossing and give warning. So the first generation technology, it's basically uh, some circuitry that's attached to the railroad track. Uh, electrical current is run through these tracks. It's an isolated block of tracks. And when the train turns, because it's all metal, the axle of the train completes the, the electrical circuit and that, that's how it knows that there's you know, something there. And then it triggers the warning devices. In general, you would not be able to accommodate uh, varying speeds uh, of the train in terms of warning. So the, the length of the warning is somewhat approximate in this particular case. They usually have about 30 seconds 20 seconds, I believe, is the minimum required, but generally they like to time them about 30 seconds of working time. So, um, so that's the first generation. Second generation is a little more advanced. Uh, so these are detectors, whether they are radar, or acoustic, or you know, vibration detection, or laser detection, or video or optical detection systems. They all have their own limitations in terms of weather and and you know, if you've got several different trains crossing at the same time and things like that, but they are a step ahead of the first generation technologies. Um, some of the advantages for these technologies are that they may be deployed outside of railroad right of way. Why is that important? I'll briefly talk about that, uh, especially if you're doing research. In that case, uh, sometimes the railroad companies don't want to in your right of way. Um, so I'll talk more about that. Uh, but in any case, like I said, there are limitations on, on these technologies as well. And then the third generation technologies are uh, basically providing continuous updated information on the train, its speed, its location, something like that. So generally you will have a GPS unit on, on the train and, and some, some way of communicating with that. Uh, it'll provide current position, speed, length, and other information on the train. However, it means that each train has to be instrumented with 
with that particular technology. Now, railroad companies have that technology, but if you ask them to share that information with you for a variety of reasons, they will not share that information with you. Uh, in any case, that's about train detection, and it's an important aspect for really crossing safety. So I'll briefly talk about some of the research projects that I've done in, in the past. Uh, this particular one was an intelligent transportation system application to highway rail crossings. Uh, uh, Basically, one way to improve traffic safety is if you are able to reduce highway traffic when a train is crossing, you, you know, reduce the chances of accidents at those crossings. Uh, so um, if you can provide information on alternate routes to uh, drive motor vehicle drivers that are headed towards a crossing, that a train is crossing, it'll take nine minutes and 35 seconds. Uh, you are best uh, to take an alternate route uh, that may be either great separated or something that will end up if the driver takes the alternate route then you know that reduces traffic at the crossing and makes for a more efficient transportation system and improves or potentially improves safety. So uh, this is a case for South Sioux City in Nebraska. They had requested us to you know set up a system, advanced traveler information system at a rail crossing, uh, this was in the middle of the of the city, and trains were long, and you know basically it would uh, prevent traffic from going highway traffic from going from one side of the city to the other side of the city. They did have an alternate route, which was a little longer, but they thought that if we could provide drivers with information, then they would take the alternate route, and then perhaps. Uh, make the system more efficient and safe. Uh, so we started working on this one, and uh, part of it we had to embed uh, vibration sensors, um, attach them to the tracks in order to figure out if there was a train. And then the uh, series, if you have a series of these sensors, then you can figure out, you know, when the train, the time it takes to cover the distance between successive sensors so you can get an estimate of the train speed and then accordingly you can figure out the length of the train and, and how fast it's going you can figure out the delay at the crossing and then provide that information via let's say a variable message sign to drivers that may be headed in that direction saying hey the train's going to take whatever x amount of time and you are better off taking an alternate route um, the railroad company in this particular project was Burlington Northern Santa Fe, BNSF. <clears throat> they were very helpful originally. The staff was very helpful. At some point, the company doors got wind of the project. And they came down on it and they said, you guys cannot do anything in our right of way for liability reasons. And they asked us to take out, remove our equipment, and, and they were concerned that if there were an accident uh, as a result of this system, that they could be sued. Uh, so they really did not want to do anything. We tried to convince them that hey, it's going to improve safety, it's going to reduce the traffic conflicts at this location. But, but the fact that we had to have our equipment within their right of way was enough for them to say, now please get out of our right of way. So we actually ended up scrapping all of the project uh, mm -hmm. midway because we were asked to, you know, uh, if basically we were evicted out of their right of way. Uh, so that's why, you know, we started looking into technologies that would be deployed for train detection outside of their right of way. Uh, so we learned important lessons from from this and uh, you know some of those were rooted in the historic railway culture in the united states uh, railway uh, railroad companies have been deemed to have deep pockets over the course of you know many many decades and you know they really want to 
be left alone, so to say, and not be sued and, and things like that. So uh, the real industry culture and you know experiences kind of are such that if you want to work with them, you really have to have understandings and memorandums of understandings written down and things of that sort. Um, but at the end of the day, railroads are private entities and most important element to them is profitability and cutting costs and minimizing risk. If they perceive anything that increases their risk or exposure, they will not be very uh, interested in that. Uh, they are also very protective of their right of ways. Um, now at rail crossings, generally at public rail crossings, the public or public agency that's responsible for the highway um, that's crossing generally has a, uh, you know, they, they have a, um, they can use that, that piece of real estate, uh, but nonetheless it's still owned by the railroad company. Uh, so, in any case, this particular project for South Sioux City was a learning experience for us. Uh, we learned a lot from it, even though we were unable to complete the, uh, the project. Uh, so, this is a more recent uh, intelligent transportation system application that, uh, you know, was based on the lessons that we learned back then in, in the South Sioux City project. Uh, in this case, again, we had somewhat of a similar situation that uh, a lot of the traffic in the city of Lincoln needed to access Highway 77 that's shown in the graphic here. Um, the road that most of the traffic uses to access Highway 77 is called Old Cheney. And there is a ad grade rail crossing um, as I've indicated in, in this uh, map. And as well, there is an alternate route, but the alternate route is a little longer, but the alternate route is grade separated, uh, so that if you take that, you are not dealing with any train crossings. Uh, so it was a good location for us, and we decided that we use the same idea of providing information to drivers when there is a train that's crossing and maybe perhaps they'll take the alternate route based on the information provided. Uh, so we were interested in looking at how many motors will divert uh, to take advantage when there is a train that's crossing. So, uh, so this is just the setup for it. And you know, we had to have, because trains were going, there were actually two sets of tracks and trains could be crossing at the same time. So we had to have a lot of sensors that would detect trains um, in any direction and then provide that information to a, uh, basically a computer system. And then the computer system would provide, um, would communicate with a variable message sign that was installed prior to that alternate route and, um, and uh, advising drivers to take an alternate route. Uh, so this is, I'll quickly go over some of these slides. There are probably more details than I can cover in these, uh, but we call that train occupancy time estimation system or TOADS was the system that we ended up developing. It had three modules. Uh, one was the train detection module or subsystem. So this was basically trying to figure out if there is a train or, or no train. And then there was a detection control subsystem. So once the train was detected, then it estimated, you know, how long it's going to take and what would be the delay uh, that would be experienced. And then the third component was the variable message sign subsystem, which received the information from the detection control subsystem and displayed the information to motorists that were headed towards the crossing. Um, so these three, you know, communicated with each other uh, to obtain the estimated train arrival and crossing and, and you know, the crossing occupancy time and then displayed it to the drivers. Um, so again, this is just a graphic of, of the system. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details, but it was, there were radio links uh, that were used for train detectors and, and a computer and go ahead. Um, the VMS subsystem, so 
when there was no train, you know, it just, we had the option of not displaying the, any message or, you know, just displaying a generic message of drive safely or something like that. And then once the uh, train was detected, then we, you know, train arriving soon or train arriving in seven minutes or two minutes or whatever, X amount of time. And then, um, you know, uh, we also had a choice of just saying train ahead to motorists, or we could provide them with more detailed information in terms of expected delay, seven minutes, 15 seconds or something like that. So, so there were several different options, some more generic than, than others. Uh, we opted to provide more detailed information to drivers in terms of their expected delays and things like that. Um, this is just the logic of the TOTS uh, system. I'm not going to go into the details of those. Keep going. Next. Um, we did have some issues with the TOTS um, system that kind of we ended up making it into a simpler uh, transportation or detection system. One of the problems was the simultaneous or overlapping train detection. So if trains were traveling at the same time from both directions, uh, there was a chance for the sensors to get confused in terms of which train was being detected. And again, we were working outside of the right of way. So we were limited in terms of what we could, uh, you know, what type of sensors to use and and how to place them so that we could figure out the direction of the train. And, and the train tracks are pretty close to each other. So it's kind of difficult to, uh, the cost of the whole system in terms of developing it from the ground up uh, became quite significant. And also there was the risk of providing information to the drivers that may not be correct. Uh, so we didn't want to do that. So in the end, would we, because we wanted to collect some data on tra traffic diversion of drivers and things of that sort, we actually ended up in order to test the system, we ended up with manual input of the toads. So basically we had during rush hours, we had someone actually operate the system, physically operate the system. So if there was a train, the, the, you know, the, the operator actually figured out that there is a train just in order to avoid the system from malfunctioning and giving false information to the drivers. Uh, but this just shows the, the, data, the field data setup, you know, in the picture you can see uh, um, the trailer, this had a variable message sign installed on it and it provided information to drivers. It was solar, uh, powered with solar, uh, panel and then anytime there was a train crossing then we displayed the information in terms of delay and then on the in the what is termed as figure 4.3 in, in this uh, on this slide uh, this is basically the intersection where drivers have to decide if they go straight then they will encounter the train if they take that left turn then uh, they will uh, be using the alternate route. The alternate route is a little longer, but it avoids the uh, at grade crossing. Uh, so uh, this slide just shows diversion to alternate route. Uh, we were able to kind of do a before and after study. So we looked at what was on average the left turn in traffic before we started operating the system. And we had some numbers for left turning traffic during rush hours. And then once we turned on the system and started providing information to drivers on train delay, then we started looking, at, you know, we noted down the left turning traffic. And then we ran some statistical tests on those and found out that the left turn diversion, diverting traffic was statistically significantly higher when we provided the information. However, it was only statistically significant at 10, alpha equal to 10%. So uh, a few reasons why we thought there was 
not more left turning traffic. Uh, one was the train delays were relatively uh, of short duration. Um, they were anywhere from 1.1 minute to 6.52 minutes. So a lot of the drivers, even though they received information, they were willing to wait for five, six minutes at the crossing rather than take the alternate route. Um, also, the variable message sign that we had um, during certain times of the day, it was difficult to see with the sun reflecting off of it. So if we displayed the information, you know, it, was, it's, it was possible that the drivers didn't see it very well. So anyway, we, the lessons learned from this project were to keep the project costs in control because we ended up spending a lot in developing the tow system from you know the ground up, and we ended up spending a lot of resources on that, um, and we kind of ran out of resources towards the end. Um, the other project that I'd like to talk about is the issue of vehicles with long wheelbase. And generally, when these crossings are uh, constructed, the rail crossings or the railroad tracks are laid at um, you know a higher elevation than the surrounding area for drainage purposes and things like that. However, if the highway is constructed at a lower grade, then we have a hump or a bump at that crossing. And if you can imagine a vehicle with a long wheelbase can actually get stuck on these railroad tracks. And it happens often enough that it's a concern. So this is just uh, a video that illustrates the issue. Then you see your vehicle that's stuck on the tracks and then it got hit by the train because the train couldn't stop it. So it's an issue of that. I think another video that shows kind of a similar next slide. This is so sad. So this here you can see in the video, there's a semi that's stuck on the tracks and then it gets um, struck by the train. Um, again, it's basically a long wheelbase that gets stuck. So uh, for the research project, sorry, we were interested in, so here's a graphic that shows, you know, a vehicle that's stuck on the railroad tracks and it's a hump crossing. Um, we were interested in, you know, if we can, figure out these humps uh, from LIDAR data that usually is a publicly available. And um, LIDAR data gives you a fairly accurate profile of the surface. And uh, if we can model that using some kind of software uh, to figure out the hump, and then also once you figure out that there's a hump, if you can figure out if it's uh, safe for a particular vehicle with the wheelbase, known wheelbase to traverse. Uh, why is that important? <clears throat> this just shows uh, uh, the working of the LIDAR data. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into too much detail of how the LIDAR data gets collected, but it's basically an airborne platform with a LIDAR instrument that collects very detailed data on, on the profile of the surface. Uh, why is it important? Uh, so if you have flooding or some other natural disaster, uh, traffic might get directed to alternate routes. Uh, the picture here shows, I think, the 2017-18 flooding in the Midwest. Uh, this is Interstate 29, I believe, that's flooded. So traffic obviously was diverted to alternate routes. Now, alternate routes might very well have at grade rail crossings. And if you have a vehicle that gets stuck on the railroad crossing or it's struck by a train, well, now your alternate route is also blocked. So you've got a bad situation to begin with, and it's been made worse because you know there was a rail crossing at grade rail crossing and a vehicle with a long uh, 
wheelbase got stuck on it or you got struck by the train. So, so it's important that you be able to analyze your alternate routes and make sure that vehicles or whatever wheelbase are able to traverse it safely. So, uh, so this was you know, a research project that we undertook in Nebraska. We identified a few <clears throat> humped rail crossings and then used uh, publicly available GP, uh, LIDAR data to figure out if, go ahead, uh, if vehicles could cross over. So this is just some research methodology. We obtained data from different uh, sources and manipulated it in a GIS to figure out if train if uh, vehicles of different wheelbase length could safely traverse. <clears throat> so this just shows you know exaggerated profile uh, from from the field and from the lidar data. So we actually went to these crossings and and measured them using survey equipment, ethiodolite, and, and so on and so forth. And then compared that profile with what we obtained with GPS data or LiDAR data. And they seem to match relatively well. And then we went ahead and conducted on the LiDAR data um, our analysis in terms of vehicles with different wheel bases and kind of figured out if they could safely traverse or not over those crossings. Go ahead. Um, so using the GIS, we were, you know, we would drive this vehicle, so to say, on the crossing and check if it would, you know, have contact with the hump crossing or not. Um, and we did this for a variety of vehicles and on all three sites. And, you know, some of the vehicles would have had issues and, you know, these were the low boys or, or the vehicles that were carrying these uh, uh, car carrier trailers and so on and so forth. Usually they have very low clearance, um, six inches, seven inches clearance. So, so those would have had issues with at these particular locations. In any case, it's uh, research that shows that you could actually obtain information on these hump crossings using publicly available light on that. Um, so some of the conclusions, you know, from that particular research were that you can use LIDAR data successfully to figure out. And in, if you have emergency situations that require you to divert traffic to alternate routes, perhaps it's best to check if they have at rail crossings and, and if they have any hump crossings and, and what type of vehicle vehicles can safely traverse those hump crossings. And if there are vehicles that perhaps may not be safe, able to safely cross over, you know, you, you can put restrictions on their crossings um, and prevent them from using particular locations. So over here, um, I frequently get asked, why do we have accidents that are happening at rail crossings. I mean, trains are huge and, and, uh, and loud and, and why don't motorists see them and, and you know, get away from, from these uh, rail crossings. And when I started doing research in rail crossing safety, I also thought, well, I mean, rail, rail trains are loud and they are not traveling that fast, although at some places they might be traveling 70, 75 miles per hour in rural areas. But in urban areas, which is where most of the accidents occur, um, you know, they're not traveling that fast. And usually they're required to sound the horn and there are warning signs and, and this, that, the other. So why do these accidents happen? So, uh, you know, the videos, clips that you will see here, you know, kind of gives you an idea of why different accidents happen. In this particular case, there's this uh, truck driver that's probably unaware of the overhang and gets struck by the train because the driver wasn't aware. In this case, the driver that takes onto the crossing and, you know, should have probably stopped is vehicle that probably was stuck on the crossing. Another one that struck on the crossing. 
which is no good. Good advice. This was most likely a, a, a test, a vehicle that tried to cross when the train was coming. I'm getting depressed by looking at those accidents. Very sad. And here, this is the one that you already saw, the one with the vehicle, long wheelbase. Oh, that's a limousine. It's a limousine. <laughs> <laughs> Should have been there. Yeah. These are all from the Nebraska area? No, they no, are nationwide. Are nationwide. And here's one where there's a person trying to beat the train and gets nailed. And a lot of times, so drivers, Motor vehicle drivers will try to you can stop it. Um, so motor vehicle drivers will try to beat the train. They see the train coming. There's some evidence that it's difficult to uh, judge the speed of large moving uh, objects. Uh, so they might very well underestimate the speed of the large uh, train, and they, they feel that they have more time to clear the crossing when they don't. Uh, but Pretty much all the accidents at rail crossings, uh, they are the result of uh, motor vehicles that trespass basically onto the rail crossing. They are supposed to yield to passing trains because the trains cannot stop at a dime. So pretty much almost all accidents are the result of you know, issues with the motor vehicle drivers. And a lot of them are because they, so many times they see the train coming, they don't want to stop for the five, six minutes that it'll take for the train to cross. They take every chance and, and probably 99.9% .9 of the time they are, they, they make it safely to the other side. But, you know, every now and then they get nailed and, and with disastrous consequences. Uh, some of these crossings, many times in urban area, they have complicated geometries. Um, they might have <clears throat> traffic signals in, in, in proximity. Sometimes those traffic signals, they should have preemption uh, so that if a train is detected, then you know, the traffic signal lets the queue go in you know, and prevents the queue from building up to the railroad tracks. Sometimes if the queue is longer, you might have issues at the safety issues at the crossing. Um, sometimes there is uh, just people not paying attention and they are oblivious to those trains. And that's where some of those suicide attempts or, or come in, you know. Uh, we've had, you know, a railroad observation stretch of railroad crossings in Lincoln that we observe, you know, we've set up our equipment and we get the feed in our transportation lab. We observe what's going on with the cameras report 24 seven. Uh, one morning I came to office and I, I had a phone call uh, from BNSF saying they needed the morning's footage. And I was like, well, what's going on? And it turned out that there was a pedestrian fatality overnight. And the BNSF folks uh, wanted to look at the footage because they knew we were recording there 24-7. Uh, so then I went and looked at the footage and sure enough, there was a pedestrian fatality early morning. Um, at the time, we didn't have any protocols for dealing with such a situation. Uh, so anyway, after that, because it's possible that you might record something that lawyers may want or railroad companies may want. So we had to implement protocols in terms of what you're gonna do if you end up with such information recorded. So, um, so it's an interesting area of research. Uh, there are some unique aspects to it. A lot of times you have to work outside of the rail, railroad right of way because it's privately owned and if they don't want you in there, you can't access it. Uh, nonetheless, it's an interesting area. Uh, the whole railroad industry is interest, interesting um, given <clears throat> their historical significance and the amount of freight that they move. Right now, if you're following the news, there's actually a strike that 
by the railroad uh, workers um, union, especially the conductors and uh, train engineers union. Uh, they might go out on strike on Friday, uh, this coming Friday, early morning. And if they go on strike, that has significant implications for the economy, the supply chains, uh, because basically no freight will be moving by, by railroads. Uh, the railroad, any train is required to have a conductor and train engineer, and if they go on strike, basically... Yeah, the White House is desperately working on this. Yes, because it has, again, it has significant implications for the, the economy, well, for the economy of the country. <laughs> Right, so so they are yes, and the it's a unique setup. The railroad industry setup is unique. That it allows the White House to to intervene. Uh, otherwise, it would would have been a matter between the unions and the railroad companies. But in this case, it allows the White House to intervene. In, yeah, so it's a unique setup, different than other industries. Uh, so we'll see what happens, but um, like I said, if there is a strike, it has very significant uh, implications for the U.S. economy and the recession and so on. So, so questions, comments, happy to answer. Any question? Any question for uh, also? So it's a typical indicator question online. No? First of all, from the from the room. I have a question. Sure. Have you already uh, been working with considered the GPS tracking of your trains as a uh, cost effective alternative so that it goes directly to the person's phone and then having to set up the light, uh, LED light machines? So, um, so very good question. Uh, it's about having a GPS unit or some kind of a unit on trains. So, the train the railroad companies in reality have the technology on on their railroad engines uh, because they want to know where their trains are and yeah you know, they a lot of them especially the class one railroad companies know exactly where the trains are uh it, we as researchers or we cannot install any equipment uh, because you know the railroad stock is privately owned these are private companies uh you would have to ask them uh, for that information, but they are reluctant to share that for a variety of reasons. One is, you know, they are competitive um, and they don't want the competition to know it, what they are hauling, when they are hauling, so on and so forth. The other reason is uh, liability. So they want to know exactly what you will be doing with if they provide the data to you. Um, again, going back to our South Sioux City project, uh, once the lawyers got involved, you know, because of liability research, we were unable to do our uh, research. But even though the staff on site were willing to help us, uh, but but they were asked not to uh, not to work with us for liability reasons. So even though that information exists in terms of where the trains are and, and what their speeds are and so on and so forth, there would have to be some type of legislation that requires the railroad companies to share that information, especially in the vicinity of rail crossings. Now with you know autonomous vehicles, it would be useful for the autonomous vehicle to know that there's a train that's going to be there in 10 seconds or 5 seconds or X amount of time. And that can be broadcast by, by the train, but the railroad companies are not interested in in, in that industry for now. They are, in the, they are interested in anything that would help them with their bottom line, but you know, if you go and say, well, it's going to help me do better research or improve safety and this, that, the other, because it doesn't line up or it may not line up with their bottom line, they might be reluctant to work with them. So unless there is something from the Congress in terms of requiring them to share that information, it, you would have to have your own detectors, especially for autonomous vehicles that detect the presence of trains and then broadcast that information to autonomous vehicles at that location. Any other question? Uh, I actually I actually have a little bit it's more like a curiosity because you mentioned like uh, LiDAR data. Um, how does the collection of this data work? Like 
do you have uh, are there sources available for this? Because I know this technology is very expensive, right? So you can collect LIDAR data on your own. There are companies that you can hire and they will fly a you know drone or whatever to collect that data or, or some kind of an airborne platform to collect the data just for you. Uh, that's obviously a little expensive. Again, it also depends on other variety of other things in terms of the density of the points that they collect and also if they end up feeling the data for you. There's also, if you've got, uh, let's say, tree canopy, a lot of the LIDAR uh, will, get, will get reflected off the treetops and things. But then some of them will penetrate down and, and get, so it's called first return and last return. Do you want the first return? Do you want the last return? Do you want both? So, and the companies can clean and give you a profile of the earth or it can include the canopy as well. But anyway, long story short, you can have them collect data for you. Now there are public agencies that for a variety of reasons, you know, water resources, erosion, this, that, the other, they have already collected LIDAR data and they've made it available online. Oh. Uh, it, not, not the entire country is not covered. There are portions of the country that are covered. Um, so you can you reach out and, or, or download those data and those are already available. Um, you might come across issues in terms of the density of the LIDAR information. You know, so more dense, more accurate profile, less dense, you know, more coarse information. So when you are doing 3D modeling in the software, more data will obviously lead to more, you know, uh, more accurate profile data, but it increases the cost of computation and so on and so forth. Do we have any questions? No? Dr. Shoma, you have a question? I just had a quick philosophical question. Sure. You, you said that the standard design approach, whatever the standards are, right. they only provide nominal safety. Right. And more substantive and quantitative research goes on like to figure out the substantive. How research. long does it take to get those substantive research findings to find themselves in the So, so the so the so the in a time frame. Yeah, so the facility would have to operate for a few years uh, before there'd be enough data in terms of accidents to kind of get get a good feel for it. So, so, so maybe three years would be my guess. Uh, there are issues with using longer uh, time frames. So, so if you, let's say, use 10, 12, 15 year time frame, well, this vehicle fleet might change uh, during that time period and so on and so forth. So it's basically a trade-off again. One year, probably two less, two years, uh, I don't know if you would have enough accidents. Again, if you have, let's say, a facility that operated for two years and no accidents were reported, does that mean it's a safe facility or you just got lucked out and there were no accidents, but in the third year, you might have a lot of accidents. So it's kind of a difficult, it's a judgment call, but I would, feel a little more comfortable with three years, uh, at least having the facility run for three years. Um, more four or five would be better, but three years probably is it. Gives you enough chance that you're, if it's inherently unsafe, there probably is gonna be something that will happen within three years and, and you'll have some information to compare with other enter, similar entities. I think, I think we can stop here. You can continue discussing later. Dr. Gattac, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The WPS would like to thank you, so we can take a picture. Zoitza. Thank you, Dr. Sosa, for coming here and providing a nice presentation. We can take a picture together. All right. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I hope it was useful. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank everyone, and thank also, thank also the people in the Zoom. Okay, Joitza, thank you. Dr. Gattac, and Dr. Ilias, and Dr. Soba, they are going to 
accompanying you for lunch. I don't know what happened with Eric Khan. 